Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And before I start my presentation, I would like to thank SF, Iris, and SSA, and OMSI for making this event possible. And um, it's a great honor for to be here and uh, also to be one of the 2021 Iris SSA Distinguished Lectures. And I would also like to thank Paul Dahl at Iris for her great help and efforts organizing all these events. And all my collaborators, Paul Kubo, Peter Scherer, and Falk Amala for all their contributions to my work. And as a seismologist, I'm always grateful to USGS and Iris for making this fabulous data set um, available for my research. And most of my projects are supported by NSF. All right, so today I will talk about a recent eruption at one of the most active volcanoes in the world, Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii. In 2018, so exactly four years ago from today, there was this eruption. So this was the biggest eruption in the lower East Rift Zone. So right here, the lower East Rift Zone and uh, the summit caldera collapsed over here. So this was the biggest event in at least 200 years. And this eruption was one of the best monitored volcanic sequences in history. And it provides an uh, outstanding opportunity for scientists to, to investigate volcanic phenomena. So for me, as a seismologist, I will use this eruption as an example to show you how seismologists investigate seismic and the volcanic hazards and what we have learned so far about Kilauea. Okay, so the outline of my talk is as follows. I will start with a very brief introduction of Hawaii and the Kilauea volcano. Then I will show you some activities during the 2018 eruption. Then after that, I will present some preliminary results based on earthquake data. And I will focus on changes in seismic parameters before and during the 2018 eruption. So these parameters include seismic wave velocity and the earthquake distribution and their focal solutions. So all these questions in the trivia earlier. So I will review these again. Then finally, I will summarize my presentation. Okay, so for seismologists like myself, earthquakes are the main source of data for our research to study the structure of the Earth and earthquake physics. And this map shows the distribution of earthquakes above magnitude 5 in the past 10 years downloaded from Aries. And the majority of these earthquakes occur along plate boundaries. And in the central Pacific here, there's a chain of islands with unique geological setting. That is Hawaii. Okay, so the Hawaii islands are volcanic and they formed as a result of a hotspot beneath the Pacific plate. And um, here in the southeast end of this chain, and that is Hawaii Island, AKA the big island. And that is the biggest and the youngest island. Hawaii Island consists of five volcanoes. I don't know if you got it right. So five of these volcanoes and the two in the south, so the Mauna Loa and the Kilauea volcanoes, these are the most active ones. And the Mauna Loa volcano is the largest shield volcano on the earth. And its summit is about 4.2 kilometer above sea level. And in this image, oh, sorry, so. Okay, so in this image, we're actually looking at Mauna Loa volcano from Kilauea. And the Kilauea volcano, which is the subject of today's uh, presentation, 
So its summit is about 1.2 kilometer above sea level. And this image shows the Halimau crater in the summit caldera. Okay, so now let's look at some major geological structures in Kilauea. And uh, this is the summit caldera. And here is the Halimau crater. Kilauea, so there are two major rift zones, the southwest rift zone and the east rift zone. The east rift zone is all, also often referred to as the upper, middle, and the lower east rift zones separately. And the 2018 eruption occurred in the lower east rift zone here. And there are also active fault systems so marked by these blue lines. And this is the Koai, and here is the Helena fault system. Both are normal faults. In addition, the south flank of Kilauea, so here, this south flank, and it also moves seaward to the southeast direction at rates of up to eight centimeters per year. And this seaward movement actually imparts the extensional stresses on this uh, reef zone. So then it facilitates East Reef Zone magma transport, dike intrusion, and the fissure eruptions. Okay, so this is a map view of Kilauea volcano. And next, let's look at a 3D view. So this slide shows one of the most commonly used model for Kilauea's magma system before the 2018 eruption. And this model was based on earthquake data, ground deformation, and the petrology. It has a few major elements. So here in the summit area, and there are two long-term magma reservoirs. So one at about three kilometer depth that is sits in the South Caldera, that is called the South Caldera Reservoir. So this is the map view, South Caldera Reservoir. And another relatively shallower one here at about one to two kilometer depths. And that is over here, the Halimomo here in the Caldera Center. And um, there's also a volcanic and a seismic southwest reef zone. So these are defined based on the magmatic and the seismic activities. And you see these reef zones are actually connected with the summit reservoirs at different depth ranges. And here, the east reef zone with a molten core here at about a three kilometer depth is connected to the South Caldera Reservoir. And as a matter of fact, before 2018 eruption, the dominant feature in Kilauea was the Pu'o eruption here. And that was a question in trivial. So, you know, this eruption started in 1983 and then it continued for 35 years until the 2018 eruption. Okay, so then, in order to answer the question on the title slide, so whether this uh, 2018 eruption was a surprise or expected. So let's look at the historical eruptions in Kilauea. As shown here, the eruptions in Kilauea mainly occur in the summit area and the reef zones. And in modern days, mainly in the summit and the east reef zone. So for the summit area, there were lots of eruptions in 1960s and the 70s. And here in the uh, Maumau crater, there was a lava, cake, uh, lava lake and it became active uh, since 2008. So you know, until 2018 eruption. However, as I mentioned before, before the 2018 eruption, the dominant feature in Kilauea was the Pu'o eruption in the middle east reef zone here. 
and this eruption started in 1983 until the 2018 eruption. And for the lower East River zone where the 2018 eruption occurred, actually before uh, 2018, the most recent, recent eruptions occurred in 1950s and 60s. So based on this historical activity and the geological mapping, volcanologists actually have long known that the lower East River zone was at high risk for lava inundation. However, the scale of the 2018 eruption was not expected. So on April 30, uh, 2018, the pool oil vent collapsed and the magma transport propagated down, down rift to the lower East Rift zone. Then on May 3rd, exactly four years ago from today, and the, the, the eruption, so the eruptive fissures opened in the lower East Rift zone. And the next on May 4th, a magnitude 6.9 earthquake occurred. And in the meantime, the summit area had many minor explosions and collapse events. These collapse events are equivalent to magnitude of five earthquakes. Okay, so then all these activities continued then gradually declined until early August. So in these three months from early May, uh, to early August, there were two types of uh, activities. So here in the summit area, there were small explosive events and the collapse events. And in the lower East Reef zone, there were fissure eruptions. So now let's look up what, 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 oh, there we go, yeah. So now let's look at the timeline. Uh, oh, I, oh, okay, sorry about it. Yeah, okay, I'll stay on the side. <laughs> so let's look at the timeline of all these uh, 2018, these eruptive activity. So starting with the lower East Reef zone. So on May 3rd, 2018, so about five o'clock in the afternoon and uh, um, eruptive fissures opened within this uh, Leilani Estates. And uh, there were total 24 fissures during this uh, whole activity. However, until uh, by the end of May, the eruption mainly focused at fissure eight. So this fissure eight is the main uh, fissure. And in June, fissure eight continued to supply channel and the lava entered this uh, called uh, Kapoho Bay in the eastern end. Then by early August, the fissure eight and you know, all other activity gradually declined. Then this shows the final lava flow map. So all these are red color. And the dark, this dark red color that shows fissure eight. Uh, uh, Fisher 8 actually was active for two months and it formed the, the majority of the lava flow field. Then next, I'm going to show you a video for Fisher 8. So also before I start, so th there are a lot of uh, videos and animations created by USGS and IRIS. So if you are interested, I strongly encourage you to check them out. And this video has a sound, so please be prepared. I think it will be loud. So that is um, what was happening in the lower East Rift zone. And now let's look at the activity in the summit area. So for the summit, so again, the eruption in the lower East Rift zone started in early May. However, 
in March and April 2018. So the lava level is at the summit and the pool oil vent, if you remember, that was the dominant feature before this 2018 eruption. So both the summit and the pool oil vent, the lava levels were observed to rise. Then in early May, so some small explosive events started in the summit area. And if you remember, I mentioned, so there was a lava lake in the Halimomo crater that became active in 2008, so 10 years before this eruption. And then by May, mid May 2018, that lava lake had drained. And there were also some small explosive events. Then in by late June, so this collapse events finally involved some larger portion of the caldera flow. And in July, the caldera area became stable. Then by early August, all these collapse events ended. So this timing was roughly consistent with the end of the lava effusion in the lower East Rift Zone. So in order to show you the the changes due to these collapse events, I'm going to show you a time-lapse sequence of images from a HVU camera. So here in the corner, you can see the time of each image. And approximately one image was selected per day during this four months period. Okay, so started in April, we see these explosions. Then in late May, perhaps it started. Yes. Then during each of these collapse events, the caldera flow dropped by several meters. And eventually, the central part dropped over 500 meters. Can I see it again? <laughs> okay. Let's. So start from April, these explosions then prepared for the collapse in almost there. Here it goes. So during these about two months, there were totally 62 collapse events. Again, as I said, each of them was equivalent to a magnitude of five earthquake. So you know, it's been going on for two months. Oh, I did it again. Since you guys like it so much, <laughs> let's do it again. <laughs> Okay, there you go. All right, so then this is the final comparison before and after the eruption. And uh, here, so the central area of the caldera flow dropped over 500 meters and the volume loss was over 0.8 cubic kilometers. So as you guys already see, so this eruption totally changed the morphology of the summit area and of course the sub the subsurface structure okay so then this slide just summarizes all these activities in the lower east reef zone and the summit and of course as a seismologist i'm interested in earthquake data and of course the seismic activity also altered during all these three months so here this figure shows number of earthquakes per hour so this is in the lower East Rift zone. And you can see the number of earthquakes, so the seismic, seismic rate increased in early May and uh, throughout the entire month of May. Then it dropped after that, but it's still the number of earthquakes were still larger than before the eruption. Then in the summit area, we also observe earthquake number increase in early May. However, the most dramatic change are these. 
You see, these started in late May and throughout the entire June and July. And these actually correspond to the collapse events I just showed you guys earlier. And so, all right, so now let's look at the seismic data. So Hawaii has been serving as a natural laboratory for studying the seismic and the volcanic processes in the past few decades. The Hawaii Volcano Observatory has been operating an extensive seismic network to, to monitor and investigate hazards from these active volcanoes and earthquakes. So this map shows all the seismic stations used in our studies. And um, digital seismic data became available since 1986. So before 2018 eruption, over 370,000 earthquakes were recorded by HVO. So these are my data. As I said, fabulous, the best seismic data ever. <laughs> okay, so then, as you can see, these earthquakes mainly concentrate in Kilauea volcano, corresponding to the magmatic activity there. Then next, I show you the number of earthquakes per day. So from 1986 to 2018, and shown by these uh, blue, these uh, bikes. So this very thick, this red curve shows the total number of earthquakes. And these spikes, you know, see these correspond to the eruptive intrusive activities. But as you can see, the most dramatic change is over here in 2018. So now let's look at a close up of all these uh, earthquakes in 2018. So again, the number of earthquakes per day. So in your trivial question, it was on a regular day. So the number of earthquakes were about 30, 50. However, during this eruption, you see the number of earthquakes per day increased to hundreds, almost a thousand. And we see this increase started in May and dropped in August. And in my study, I actually refer to earthquakes from April 11 to August 31st as my eruption sequence because the number of earthquakes during this time period was much larger than the background activity. Okay, so first we look at seismic wave velocity. So you guys already answered P wave as wave velocities. And in recent years, there's a technique called ambient noise interferometry. It's been very popular in uh, seismic, uh, seismology community. So what is ambient noise? Ambient noise is a seismic wave generated by either human or environmental activities, such as ocean or atmosphere. So the idea of this ambient noise is we can actually use ambient noise data recorded by a pair of stations, or even just at a single station, we can actually use that ambient noise data to calculate very subtle changes in seismic wave velocity. And these changes are actually associated with the changes in material properties of the subsurface. So the advantage of this method is it doesn't rely on the occurrence of earthquakes. So we don't have to wait for earthquakes to happen. So as long as we have seismic stations, then we can apply this technique. Then this ambient noise interferometry has been very popular and very exciting monitoring too for active volcanoes. So some studies have applied this method to the 2018 Kilauea eruption. So once these studies used uh, seismic stations in the summit area, so here shows the summit and uh, these triangles are the seismic stations. So they actually look at seismic wave velocity changes before the eruption on May 3rd. So here, the date in March, April, and here shows the velocity variation in percentage. 
And what they observe is, so about two months before the eruption, so in March and April, they actually see this very slow increase in velocity. And they actually uh, interpret this as due to the gradual inflation of the volcanic edifice. Then about two weeks before the eruption here, then they observe a very sudden drop in seismic wave velocity. And they related this to the, the accumulating damage due to the pressure from the uh, magma reservoir. And another study look at velocity variations corresponding to those collapse events. So here, what I draw are all the earthquakes during these uh, two months period. And I actually plot all these, these red dots are those big collapse events equivalent to magnitude of five earthquakes. So then they study look at velocity variations corresponding to these 62 collapse events. So what they did is actually to stack all these 62 events. So we can just think of these stack as an average. So they basically look at the average velocity change corresponding to these collapse events. And as shown here, you see they actually put all these 62 events all together. Then they look at the velocity variation a few hours before and a few hours after the collapse events. Now what they see is, so they actually observe a pre-collapse decrease in velocity and a very sharp increase in velocity, the post collapse increase. And then they attributed this to the magma pressurization. Then a few hours after this peak, then the velocity gradually went back to the background level. So of course, there are a lot of details in, these, in the calculation of these subtle changes in seismic velocity. But here, all these results tell us the seismic wave velocity was changed corresponding to these major events. So either the eruption or these collapse events. Okay, so that is the velocity. Then now we're looking at the earthquake distribution. So this is the related, uh, the focus of earthquake. Focus, so that's the location of earthquake. And on this map, I show the earthquake distribution for about 100,000 earthquakes from 1986 to early 2009. So you see, this is the way before the 2018 eruption. And I would like to use this as a background reference to, to just tell you what it was like before the eruption. So here I color each earthquake by their year. So the cold color for older events and the warm color for uh, new events. Then we see the earthquakes concentrate in the summit area and the south flank here. Then next we want to look at some depth distribution. So we first pick a profile uh, area. So here, along profile A and B. Then what we do is we plot all these earthquakes along this profile A and B. So this is the distance from profile A and B. And then here is the depth. And you see these uh, pink dots here at the top. So those are actually the ground surface. And here in the summit area, the ground surface is about one kilometer above sea level. The sea level is actually the zero depth here. So then from this depth distribution, we see the earthquakes in the summit area are actually distributed from the ground surface to very deep, about 15 or even deeper uh, layers. Then we want to look at another profile. So along south flank and uh, east reef zone and uh, here. So again, we show the distribution along CD profile. This is the distance, this is the depth. And uh, 
a very obvious feature. So we can see the dominant structure along this profile is this subhorizontal, this linear. Oh, where's my point? This linear structure at about at about a seven kilometer depth. So that's a very long term uh, structure in the south flank. And what is this? This actually corresponds to the very famous basal declamal in Kilauea. So what is declamal? So that is an interface that separates the volcanic edifice and the oceanic crust. So, you know, for about 30 years of seismic data, this was the dominant feature. And this set at seven kilometer depth, the basal declamal. All right, so that is what the seismicity looks look like before the 2018 eruption. Then now let's look at during the eruption. So similarly here, I show earthquakes during the 2018 eruption. And here I color all these earthquakes with their time. And uh, here the color for the eruption sequence from May 11th to August 31st. And I actually also included some earthquakes a couple of years before the eruption, so shown by these gray dots, just as you know, a reference, a baseline. And uh, again, we want to look at the depth distribution of these earthquakes. So along the same profiles, AB in the summit area, CD along south flank and uh, east drift zone. Okay, here it goes. So this is the seismicity distribution during the 2018 eruption. So we want to compare this with the background seismicity, so the way before the eruption happened. Then firstly, in the summit area, then we see, well, during the 2018 eruption, the earthquake distributions are pretty similar to the background activity. You see the earthquakes are distributed from the ground surface to about 15 kilometer depth. And the one small difference is a lot of earthquakes actually concentrated at the shallower depths. You know, you see that uh, a red blob there at about a three kilometer depth. So that is due to the magmatic activity at the shallow depth. Then we look at the CD, this profile, then they, they look quite different. Then now we look at these two in some detail. So the first thing is, well, we know the dominant feature before the eruption was this basal, this declamant at about a seven kilometer depth. Well, it's still there. It, it you know, it, it's, uh, as I said, it's a long-term uh, feature. So it's still there. <laughs> but during the eruption, what is new are these? Shallow earthquakes that was not there before the eruption. And you see these earthquakes are very shallow at about a three kilometer depth. And if you remember earlier why I showed you the 3D view of Kilauea's magma system, East Reef Zone has this molten core at about a three kilometer depth. So why I saw these shallow earthquakes, the first thing that came to my mind, very appealing mechanism, I was really, really excited, is this was due to dike intrusion. However, when I look at this, you know, in more details, see if I can go back here, and you see those very shallow earthquakes, some of them actually occurred here near the Helena fault system, which is about five kilometers away from East Reef Zone, and that the molten core along this East Reef zone was supposed to be a little bit narrower than that. So then after I look at this, then I thought was 
we probably need some mod modeling to really, you know, conclude whether these earthquakes are really due to Daiki intrusion, especially for these, you know, two layer, this linear seismicity band. So this is one interpretation for these shallow earthquakes. And an alternative interpretation for these shallow uh, earthquakes is these earthquakes are probably correspond to the contact of the submarine flank of Mauna Loa volcano with the base of Kilauea volcano. As a matter of fact, geological studies suggest Kilauea here, the Kilauea volcano is actually a relatively thin scab on the, uh, the submarine flank of Mauna Loa volcano. And its base is actually located at about one to two kilometer depth below sea level, which was consistent with our new, uh, newly observed seismic layer at a three kilometer depth. So again, as I mentioned, in order to conclude what are really, you know, what really caused these shallow earthquakes, we need support from simulations and other type of data. But again, this is a very interesting observation. Then next, we want to look at the focal solutions of these earthquakes. And we want to know whether the focal solution changed before and after the eruption. And so for any given fault plane, so here shows a fault plane and if so based on the relative motion of the two blocks, then we actually can characterize fault types into three different groups. So strike slip, normal, and the reverse. So basically, if the two blocks, they have this horizontal relative movement, then that is a strike slip fault. The example is the famous St. Andrews fault in California. Then if the, the block above the fault plane moves downward relative to the block below the fault plane, then that is a normal fault. Normal faults are caused by extensional forces. So it results in extension. And if the block above the fault plane moves upward relative to the block below this fault plane, then that is a reverse fault. And the reverse faults are caused by compressional forces and, and it results in shortening. So if you remember on May 4th, 2018, so the day after the eruption, there was this magnitude 6.9 earthquake. So that earthquake was actually a reverse fault. And so for normal fault and a reverse fault, they are also referred to as deep slip. So we have the horizontal strike slip and the vertical deep slip. And in reality, so almost all the faults have some strike slip and the deep slip components. Then they are called oblique. So, and uh, so three main fault types, strike slip, normal and the reverse. And these animations are all from Iris and Iris has the best animations for education outreach and I use them in my class all the time. So I encourage you to check them out. And for my research, and in order to quantify these strike slave, deep slave, all these components. So obviously I cannot draw all these faults all the time. So then what I do is for each earthquake that I use the earthquake date to invert their focal mechanism. So you, they tell me what type of fault, strike slip, normal or reverse. Then I use something called a scalar focal solution. So of course, I'm not going to show you how to derive the scalar focal solution. But instead, here, I just use this color scale to tell you what type of fault we're looking at. So in the next few slides, if we see these red colors, then they are normal faults. 
Now, if they are green, then they are strike slip. Now, if they are blue, then they are reverse. Okay, ready? So, for 2018 eruption, so these are the earthquakes a couple of years before the eruption. And uh, then we see here in the summit area, we see a lot of uh, green colors. So these are strike slip faults. And uh, these are actually consistent with the south flank seaward movement. So remember, we sh I showed earlier, so the south flank moves seaward in this direction. So this, these green strike slip focal solutions are actually consistent with this movement because there's some stress concentration due to this persistent seaward movement. And here in the south flank, and most of these are red. So these are normal faults. And again, the major Helena fault system, so that is normal faults. So good, these are consistent with the local geology. So this is before the eruption. And now let's look at what happened after, during the eruption. So firstly, in the summit area, then we see a lot more red colors. So these are the normal solutions. What are these? These are those collapse events. So you can think of those collapse events as like piston, right? So every single collapse event that our caldera flow drops by a few meters. So these, those collapse events are actually normal solutions. Then in the south flank here, remember before they were red, they were normal faults. And during the eruption, they became red, um, it became blue, so it became reverse. And if you remember, we actually mentioned the magnitude 6.9 main shock was actually reverse fault. So why I first saw this, then, the first idea was these earthquakes must be the aftershocks of the 6.9 main shock. And since the main shock was a reverse fault, so mm, kind of makes sense these earthquakes are also reverse. So in order to examine this, what I did next is to look at the time of all these earthquakes within this pink box. So then on this slide, what I I'm showing you is the focal solution of each earthquake. But here, the horizontal shows their time. So for all these earthquakes, so these, each circle represent an earthquake, a focal solution. And the, the horizontal, that's the time. Then the vertical, that's the scalar focal solution. So again, just to remind you, we have three types of focal solutions. So normal, strike slave, and the reverse. Then what I did next is, I so for all these earthquakes, I group all the earthquakes in each month. Then for the earthquakes, for all the scalar focal solutions within that month, I calculated the average scalar focal solution. Then I plot that average solution in the middle of each month. So shown by these black squares. And it, so this makes sense, right? If you remember before the eruption, so here before 2018, all those solutions were dominated by normal faults because they are consistent with the Helena fault system. However, here in 2018, so they changed. So the reverse became the dominant solution. And here, just to remind you, the eruption occurred on May 3rd and the 6.9 earthquake occurred the day after May 4th. And our eruption sequence started on May 11th. But you see, actually the change started way before this eruption and the 6.9 main shock. So actually it happened here. So when was that? That was December, 2017. So then after this, then we want to know what exactly caused this difference 
this change in focal solutions. Then next, I calculated the percentage of different focal solutions. This figure looks very basic, but actually it's, it's very simple. So what I did again for all the focal solutions in each month, I calculated the percentage of each focal type. So the red color is for normal, green for strike slip, blue for reverse. So for each month, then we have different percentage. So again, before 2018, the dominant one is the normal because of the Helena normal faults. Then we see the change started somewhere here. You see in December, 2017. So the normal faults, the percentage of normal faults suddenly dropped and uh, the percentage of reverse suddenly increased. So again, this was several months before the eruption and the 6.9 earthquake. So this actually tells us these, the change in four solutions actually are not due to our 6.9 mean shock. This actually happened several months before the eruption. And this actually suggested, so the inner stress field within the magma system actually had changed several months before the eruption and probably preparing for some magma backup proposed for this eruption. So this is a very intriguing observation. Okay, so some take home messages. So in 2018, Kilauea experienced its largest lower East Rift Zone eruption and the summit Caldera collapse in at least 200 years. And the seismology is one of the most important monitoring tools and, uh, for these active volcanoes. And this is because before and during a eruption or a intrusion, so magma and the volcanic gas, they actually force their way through the underground uh, structure then this may lead to a number of seismically detectable precursors. And for the 2018 Kilauea eruption, studies have actually identified changes in characteristics of seismic parameters. And of course, the most straightforward one is the number of earthquakes. So the seismic rate was increased from about 30 earthquakes per day to hundreds of earthquakes during the eruption. Then studies also show velocity variations corresponding to major events. These major events could be eruptions, intrusions, and the collapse events. And also in the south flank, before the eruption, so that long-term, that dominant seismic concentration at about a seven kilometer depth, that basal declement, that became a two layer linear bands. And also the focal mechanism uh, shows the stress field within the magma system actually had changed several months before the eruption. So all these data actually confirm careful analysis of all these seismic parameters can provide new insights for active volcano monitoring and they can help seismic and volcanic hazard assessment and uh, mitigation. And of course, as a seismologist, so I mainly just showed you results based on earthquake data. And the seismology is only one of the branches in geophysics. So Kilauea and Hawaii, so it's very, very comp uh, complex. So in order to fully understand this system, of course, we need to integrate geology, geochemistry, geophysics, and many other fields. Here I list uh, all the references in my presentation. And um, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. And also have my email there. So if you have any 